Welcome, Welcome to, to church. church. You are blessed, my friend. Thank you for being in church today. And I know that today's going to be a blessed day for you. Praise yes. God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, if you haven't joined a mm -hmm. Bible Connect group yet, we plan this year to pastor you through all the little groups. So make sure you are part of our Bible Connect group. The details will be on the screen. Join one and help us help you be a better Christian this year. <laughs> The church has left the building. So wherever you are all over the world, we are one church, yes. Gateway Chapel, and we are your favorite pastors. Today, Pastor Bola is ministering and ministering yes. powerfully. So yes. you sit back, enjoy the service, and the power of God will be upon you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Welcome again to church and welcome to this time of the Word of God. I am Super excited, as you know I will be, to be able to share God's word with you. This month, Pastor has been looking into the title, Can God Really Restore? And you know, I am taking an aspect of that same message that Pastor has been talking about and saying, you know, to show you how God restores and how you can get back what you've lost. So how do we get back what we've lost? That's what this aspect of the restoration message is all about. Can God restore? Yes. I know that you've heard that over the last two weeks, but today we're looking at when you think you've lost something and if you have lost something, how do you get back what you've lost? It's part of God's program and plan for you to get back everything every single thing that the enemy has stolen from you. And today we're going to be looking at that closely. All right. So just before we go into the word and into the sermon itself, let me share with you a story about a pastor that was sent to go and preach in a church. He wasn't very pleased to go there and he was told he had to go and do a three-day special for this church. So he got there the first day and he saw the congregation. They were looking up with expectation. They heard about him. They wanted him to come, but he didn't want to go. They were too remote for him to go. So he, he went there and then he got there that day and he looked at the congregation and he said to them, do you know what I'm about to preach? Or do you know what I'm about to preach about or what I'm preaching about? Of course, the congregation looked at him and they were looking very confused and he said, um, no, we don't. He said, well, I am not going to preach today because what's the point of preaching to you when you don't even know what I'm going to preach about? So he left. Uh, they were really confused. They didn't know what to do. And they thought, surely it has to be better tomorrow. Something must happen tomorrow. So the next day they came again with expectation because they've always wanted to hear from this preacher. And then the following day when they came, all sat down with expectation, brought a few more of their friends out there. We know how we're going to answer this gentleman today. And the question he asked them then, he said, so... Just before I start my preaching time, do you know what I'm going to preach about today? He said to the church. And then they looked at him, knowing, knowing that they now got it right. They said, yes. And then he looked at all of them and he said, well, now you know what I'm going to preach about. I am leaving because you know what I'm about to preach before I preach it. They were more confused than ever before. Yesterday, we said no. He said he's leaving because we can't be bothered. Today we said yes. He said he's leaving because we already know what he's about to preach. What are we supposed to really do? So come day three, which was the final day this pastor was meant to spend with them. They then decided they were going to come to church a little bit earlier. And then they had a church congregation meeting. And in the congregation meeting, they said, we know what we're going to do. We're going to address things just the way this man wants us to today. We have a strategy. So the pastor came, day three, the final day of his trial. And he said, well, welcome to church today. Um, I want to ask all of you, the same way he asked the same question the previous two nights. Would you know what I'm about to preach about? Half of the church said yes. The other half of the church said no. They thought, now we caught him. What's he going to do? He looked to them. He said, well, the half of the church that said yes, now you know what I'm about to preach Preach it to the other part of the church that said no. <laughs> and then he left again. <laughs> he wasn't willing to preach to them. And so he was going to use any excuse under the sun to avoid preaching to this bunch of people. But I am grateful to God that God sent me to you. I am happy to preach to you today and you don't have that problem. You don't need to even know what I'm about to preach about. You don't need to say yes, you don't need to say no. You just need to listen to the voice of the Holy Ghost. And I know as you do, he will speak to you himself. 
every single word he desires for you to hear in Jesus' name. All right. I, I hope you found that funny because I found it very funny when I read it. Okay, let's pray. Fam, thank you because the entrance of your word today will give us light and we give understanding as we come with simplicity of heart. We pray today that you will speak through me to every single one present today in the name of Jesus. Lord, deliver your people. Restore, oh God, to them every single sin that the enemy have stolen in the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor because you will speak powerfully to our hearts today. In Jesus' precious name we've prayed. Amen and amen. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Job. Joel chapter 2. The key scripture we're going to use today is in Joel chapter 2 verses 25 to 27. And the Bible says, and I will restore to you, this is God speaking, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I have sent, and you shall eat in plenty and you will be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who had dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else my people shall never be ashamed one of the um, aspects of the word of the year that pastor gave to us at the beginning of the year in Isaiah chapter 61 uh, one of the aspects of that scripture says that this instead of your shame you will have double so God has always had it in mind to replace shame with double and this is why and amongst many things our year is a year of double honor this is that year that you should expect double so let's talk about the reasons why we need restoration why is there a need for restoration in the first instance. If you remember this scripture that I read is about the children of Israel. They, the, Jude, the, the children of Israel at some point they were divided into two parts of the nation the northern and the southern part so the part that had Judah in it was where prophet Joel was speaking and he was speaking prophetically as well as he was speaking about that time as well as he's speaking about you and I at the moment and he was saying to them look things are happening that you're not happy about things are happening around us and it's called locust in this context and what does a locust mean to in, a, to in an agrarian society locust that those animals or those insects that come and eat up every single thing a farmer has worked on. Farmers work really, really hard. The work of the farmer in, in preparing the ground, in preparing the seed, in sowing the seed, in, in watering the seed, in making sure that they trim the edges and do all that they need to do and prepare every single thing for the day of harvest. That is the process or the cycle of what a farmer does. However, when this kind of thing or uh, this kind of enemy of success or progress or of results is introduced into the equation, then a farmer is in serious trouble. I was reading a little bit about locusts and I realized that they are very, they call it ravenous eaters. They eat a lot. An adult desert locust, it weighs only about two grams, but they can eat roughly that amount of food every single day. You can, can you imagine eating the amount of food that you weigh every single day? And usually, one, one locust, one adult locust can eat up to one, what 35,000 people will eat in a season. 35,000 people's food can be eaten by just a group of locusts in a day. So that is a disaster if a farmer mistakenly has locusts on his farm. In fact, part of the things I studied about locusts also says that they cause about 50 to 80% of crops to be destroyed if they come on a particular piece of ground. And if it's a real season where they swarm the place, they can destroy the whole thing. In fact, the, large, the last large locust outbreak in the world was recorded in 2003. And it lasted up to 2005. And during that period, $2.5 billion worth of crops were destroyed. Basically, you get my point. These are things that are sent to destroy and to make sure that losses come into people's lives. So that is the point of locusts. Locusts are there to create losses. And don't forget, there is a particular way Jesus puts it in the New Testament. He said, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So when you have locust-infested life, you're talking about a life that is 
is lost or things that are lost that should never have been lost. Things that I've lost that it's not the design that God has for you. And that's the reason why we look up to God for restoration. And this is a very, very good time to do that. For many, many people, last year 2020 seemed to be a year like the year that the locust ate. Lost year, lean year, difficult year for a lot of people. Unplanned, unexpected. Your income did not go the way you thought it was going to go. Your health did not go the way you thought it was going to go. Things did not go the way you thought they were going to go. But the beauty of the God we serve is that we have a God and serve a God that specializes in restoring and it can restore and return back to us every single thing that we have lost. In the period where we look like there's nothing happening. In a period where it looked like the, 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 the sowing is not, the reaping is not commensurate with the sowing, a farmer will go into the farm and spend so much time expecting expecting harvest at some point. But when locusts comes and they eat up the harvest, they, the farmer gets only a very small percentage, if anything, out of that piece of land. And for some people, that's how last year was. That's how some of the period that they've been in, some people seem to be like their life at the moment in one area or the other is like locust years or lost years. When, what, what exactly do lost years look like? Number one, the first thing I want to say about lost years or locust years or times or reasons like this why we need restoration is lost years are fruitless years. You know, years you work so hard and you can't see the fruit of your labor. For some people, it's investment in businesses. The other day I was running and I walked past a particular restaurant and I knew when the restaurant opened and it opened towards the end of 2019. And that means that it, it, it hadn't started properly before the pandemic started. And between then and now, it's been closure, closure, closure to the hospitality industry. So for the owner of that investment, who has spent so much time, so much effort, before they got the place together, took a good six months, they would have gotten the money to do that, get the loan, get the venue, put the place together, work so hard in order to set up the place so that customers will like it, only to open for two months and then you have to shut down again. Now that is a, like a, what you would consider a fruitless time, fruitless years. Lost years are like fruitless years. You spend so much money and you can't see anything out of it. Maybe some people already have a business and you say, I'm going to take my business to the next level. And then you went to get a loan or maybe not even get a loan, maybe from friends or maybe it's the effort and the energy you have put into it. And and things happen and things that you have no control over because that's what happens with locusts no control whatsoever over them and then all of a sudden you can't run your business all of a sudden the investment's gone down all of a sudden things change within the area all of a sudden the place that you thought was going to be a fruitful place for you become a fruitless place and it becomes a fruitless year what do lost years look like years that locusts have eaten it's time of fruitlessness another one is what does it look like pointless years pointless times. See, I will restore to you the years that have been eaten, the lost ones. So, fruitless time. Secondly, pointless times. You know, there are some exercises you take on and you look at yourself and you think, what exactly is the point of this? No accomplishment, no purpose, no result. You did it, but you don't know why you did it and what is there to get out of it. There are some situations you go through, there are some challenges you go through, and you ask yourself at the end of the period, please tell me, somebody tell me, what is the point of this? There are many situations I have come across in the last few years and months. There are people and circumstances that have to do with, you know, the current coronavirus and, and, and the pandemic. And I look at some and I think, what such pointless death? Such pointless challenge, such pointless situation, such pointless circumstance that we found ourselves in. And sometimes you can look at that and you think, this is pointless. I can't see the reason for it. I don't know what has been achieved from this. So lost years are fruitless years. Lost years are pointless years. Lost years are loveless years. There are some people that are in relationships. So, uh, you know, and you look at the relationship. They, this relationship is loveless. There's no love in it. You look at other people's relationship and you think, how long am I going to continue like this for? You think, year one. Maybe it will change in year two or year three and so on and so forth. It's now been 10 years and it's exactly still the same. If anything was good, it's going further and further downhill. That looks like lost years. And you ask yourself, how do I get lost years back? You know, how do I get, you know, you can, you can get investment back, you can get money back, you can get restoration of health. We've talked about that and we'll talk a little bit more about those later. But wow, how on earth will God restore 
time. It looks like an impossible task. But our God is a God that specializes in doing it impossible. He can restore. He said he will restore. And loveless years can be really, really lost years for a lot of people. You know, in those big times, maybe you also have little children. They grow up in a loveless environment. They don't understand what it means for dad and mom to actually cozy up together and be one. And you look at your life and you look at your children and you look at things and you're thinking, what is the point of this? Loveless years. That's another way that low-cost years or lean years or lost years show up. Another one is directionless years. I don't know if you ever feel like that, where you are constantly asking yourself, where exactly am I going with this career? Where exactly am I going with this business? For the past five years, you know, you keep asking yourself, maybe if I didn't take this turn, maybe if I didn't make this investment, maybe if I didn't go down this road, maybe if I didn't pick this, maybe if I pick another organization. These are the ways that locust years or lost years reflect in different areas of our lives. When you feel directionless, you feel like, I don't know where I am going. If only I had not taken on this opportunity. You know, there's some opportunities that look like opportunities to you, and then you take them and you realize you found yourself down a dead road. I remember speaking to somebody who thought that they found a particular opportunity only to realize that it's a programming um, language, but it's a closed industry. It's a programming language that is a very, very unique, very, very limited, uh, 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 limited, specialized language. And then they, they, they took in quote, the opportunity to go and learn about it. And after they finished, they started asking themselves the question, all right, so now I've finished, I'm a, I can only work for this type of organization in this industry, and they are, the jobs are few and far between. So this person, after spending almost 10 years, is now thinking, there is no way to go forward, there is no way to go back, there is no way to cross train, there is no way to take the skill from this particular place into another. In fact, I remember very strongly, I was watching I watched a program where they were talking about the impact of the coronavirus on the, uh, uh, on the sailing industry, on the cruise industry. And there were a couple of people that were talking about the fact that what they did was so specialized and related to that industry that they don't know where to start from next. They don't know what to do next because what they do, they can only do if that industry is operating. And as you speak at the moment, the industry has not operated for over 18 months. So this these are things that you look back and you think this is a pointless thing. This is a pointless year lost. This is a fruitless year lost. This is a loveless year lost. This is a directionless time lost. And I would like to say a life without Christ, a Christless life is another way of expression of loss. You know, if you don't have Jesus in you, if you don't have, if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I promise you, you will look back when you do and think, what waste of time before I met Jesus. So when you look at all of this together, these are some of the ways that loss reflects itself. It says, I'm going to restore the years that the locust have eaten. So if your locust is, if, if your own life is being eaten, locust is eating it in the area of your career, I want to say to you today that Jesus has come to restore. If he's been eating in the area of your marriage, I want to say to you today that be at peace because Jesus has come to restore. If it's in the area of your health, Jesus has come to restore. If you think your life is pointless at the moment, restoration has come because God can and he still does restore. And when he restores, he will give back to you every single thing the enemy has stolen from you. I want you to be reassured in the God we serve. I want you to be reassured that this our God cares enough to deliver to deliver you and to deliver back to you every single thing you have lost. It doesn't matter how ravenous the locusts were. It doesn't matter how much they ate and nothing was left. It doesn't even matter how bad it has become because our God is a God that specializes in changing bad situations around. And I decree and I declare today in the name of Jesus that this year you will experience restoration double honor according to the word that has been spoken in the name of Jesus, that nothing will be strong enough to hold back the promise of the Lord concerning you this year in the name of Jesus. Every year spent without Christ is a waste of time. And I want you to know that if you haven't met Jesus and you are listening to me today, at the end of this service, I will give you a chance to embrace it. Embrace it embrace it. So when we have lost years, that's in the natural. When we have lost years or lost situation, we need a replacement. We need a solution. And that's why restoration comes in. You don't need restoration if you have not lost anything. 
You don't need restoration if you're not repairing anything. So what does restoration mean? Restoration is defined as to bring back something to a previous way it was before. To bring back. Restoration is an opportunity to bring back to what God has originally designed the year to be for you to reinstate. I don't know what your plans were for your marriage. I don't know what your plans were for your children. I don't know what your plans were for your business. I don't know what your plans were for your career. I don't know what your plans were for your investment. But I know that our God of restoration can bring back, can reinstate that plan and beyond. And so shall it be for you in Jesus' name. Another definition of Restoration or to restore is to return. To return someone or something to their former place or condition or position. When God wants to bless a man, he can return and restore. The story that Pastor has used over the last two weeks of the widow who had gone away and left the land and her land has been taken. By the time she returned, God made us understand that the king restored the land back to her, returned it to her, and all the profit that has happened in the harvest of that land all through the period she was not around were returned back to her. That's how God restores. Restoration to return back to a former condition, the place, or even the position. Another word, to repair or to renovate. To repair or to renovate. So as to return it to its original condition. I mean, I don't know whether many of you like it. I do like all these restoration projects and and house projects and so on and so forth. I love watching, you know, all the house repair programs and projects. And you realize when you look at the before and you look at the after, they say they have restored the house. No, they don't restore it to where it was before, actually. They make it so beautiful and better than what it was originally. So even when we're talking about restoration, we're talking about building something, renovating something, repairing something to make it better than what it was before. And I decree and I declare for you, according to the word of the Lord, that this year, the way God will restore you will be way beyond what you planned for yourself in the name of Jesus. Will be way beyond your wildest imagination in the name of Jesus. That the years that the locusts and the cankerworm have eaten concerning you, Jehovah himself will restore to you and return double according to his promise in his word in the name of Jesus. You see, many of us look at it and we say, health can be restored. And it can. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 says, I will restore to you health. God restores health. So if your health is struggling or suffering at the moment, I want you to key into the word as we speak it today, that lost health is not part of God's plan for you. God can and he will restore your health. Fortunes can be restored. Job's fortune was restored. Job chapter 42 verse 10. Read it in your time. Fortune can be restored. Money can be restored back to you. Joy of salvation can be restored. Psalm 51 verse 2. He said, restore back to me the joy of my salvation. When you become a, sa sa a saved person, joy comes with it. Excitement comes with it. And there are things that happen along the way that tries to steal that joy from you. That tries to steal your emotions. And God said, I can restore that back to you. So the soul can be restored. Restore my soul. Restore my soul. Psalm 23. Time can be restored. And that is something many of us think is not possible. We think, oh, money can be restored, of course. Uh, property can be restored. Broken relationships, we even believe, can be restored. But we find it very, very difficult to believe that time can be restored. But I want to say to you that we serve a God who can restore time. He can restore time to you. Every time that you have lost, it will restore in the name of Jesus. Joel 2.25 said, I will restore the years that the locust have eaten. That is the promise of our God to you. And that promise is more than able to fulfill. I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. You see, the first time I was conscious of this scripture was when I met Pastor Eddie. We were still, you know, young, uh, you know, young couple. He was my prayer partner, my very good friend. And I remember he shared with me, and I know he wouldn't mind me sharing it with you, that by the time before he got born again as a young, young boy, he was oppressed severely by the wicked one. He was oppressed severely by the devil. He would do exams. He would teach people in the exam. He would fail, and everybody he thought would pass. He just could not string his, um, we used to call it five credits together in order to move on to the higher institutional education, to move on to the next level of life. And he was strong and he stayed on the same spot and he knew, he knew, according to him, he knew it was an oppression of the enemy because it was obvious that it wasn't because of his mental capacity. It was the devil that was playing pranks with his destiny. And according to him, one day, he said it was a particular cross overnight. He wasn't even saved yet. He said that night, he said it was 31st December. He said, as we we're moving into the next year, he said, all of a sudden, he felt like a cloak lift off him. He felt a spiritual cloak lift off him. He said, all of a sudden, he knew it. 
that that thing has been broken and it was a new day for him. Later that year, he gave his life to Christ. And I remember when I met him, he used to say, I have lost so many years and I am on a restoration plan. And I'll tell you, man, his restoration plan was serious. Every single thing he desired for himself was happening. Every single thing he desired for his friends, those of us around him were happening. In fact, I remember saying to him then, that God loves you so much, I have to hang around you. Because things just happen for you. Now, but that's not where he was coming from before. He was coming from a place where things were constantly being lost to him. But I said his story to remind you that if you think you have had lost years, lost time, that my God can restore to you and restore to you if you are conscious and you receive that which he has prepared for you. Because truly, he has prepared for you a restoration program. So, while we are looking at it, the children of Israel themselves, during this period when Joel was speaking, they had this locust visit them, and for four consecutive years, there was no harvest. Four, not one year. You know, we're talking about the pandemic, the pandemic, and we say, well, it was since 2020 was an interesting year. And for some people, you know, a friend of mine called me and was saying, Bola, I thought all the bad news was in 2020, but I realized that in 2021, I've struggled so much, and so on and so forth. And you know, when she was talking, she was saying, it's been, it's been 12 months of hardship. And can you now imagine the children of Israel going through 48 months of difficulty, 48 months of no improvement, 48 months of no harvest and all that was happening to them and the people cried out to the Lord. And the people cried out to the Lord. The people were brought to their knees. There was no harvest. There was no food. There was no joy in the city. And they cried out to the Lord. The Bible says in verses 18 to 19 that I, then God then said, I am going to have mercy upon my land because they cried out to me. And I'll talk to you in a few minutes about the things we need to do in order to trigger our restoration so we can get back everything that the enemy has stolen away from us. And when the people cried out to the Lord, the Bible made us understand that God answered them. But just before I tell you about that, let me just whet your appetite and tell you the kind of things that restoration can give you. I've told you the reasons why we need restoration, mainly because of the loss that is based on what the locust has done in our lives. The loveless lives, the loveless years, the, 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 the fruitless years, the directionless years, the Christless years that the enemy took advantage of and stole from us. I want to tell you that restoration is possible. So what are the results of restoration? What will you see when restoration happens? The first one, God will renew your joy. When your life is restored, God will renew your joy. So I need you to get hungry, hungry for restoration because when it happens, God will renew your joy. Joy chapter 2 verse 23 says, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately, and it will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now listen to me. This is part of God's restoration program. When he gives you two things in one month, it, former rain and latter rain come two different seasons, six months apart. But God said, don't worry, in one month, in my restoration program for you, I will give you the former rain and I will give you the, the, the latter rain in the same month, in the first month, you're going to experience double. And that is God speaking to you. And wherever you are today, I decree and I declare concerning you that you will experience double this month in the name of Jesus. It is never too late for my God to change the story around and to give double. So I want you to expect the returns of restoration. It is not man that will do it. It is God that will do it himself. He said, I will. He said, joy will be returned back to you. Joy will be returned back to your home in the name of Jesus. In that place where you have lost joy because you have lost investment in time. You have lost investment in the marriage. You have lost investment in the children. You have lost financial investment. You have lost investment in health. I decree and I declare that joy will come back according to the word of the Lord in Joel chapter 2 verse 23 in the name of Jesus. When God restores, God renews our joy. Receive the joy of the Lord because your restoration has come in Jesus' precious name. When God restores, God brings us increase. He gives us increase. He adds to us. So you've got to prepare for the increase. I love the scripture in Isaiah chapter 54, verses 2 to 3. He said, look, he said, you, you that is a barren woman, you've been called barren. Nothing has happened in your land. It looks like it's so dry. Last year was nothing. The beginning of this year was nothing. But we're in February now, and God is saying for me to tell you, sing, O barren woman, according to Isaiah chapter 54, verses 1 to 2 to 3. And he says that, look, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch it. Go wide. Don't hold 
look back, lengthen your strength because more is coming. Increase is coming. When this increase comes, you will need a place to put the harvest. That's why I say prepare. Prepare because I, God, am about to visit you and restore to you. And this is that year of double honor. So that means God is restoring double to you. He says you should prepare and expand. Prepare and expand. So when God brings his increase, when God brings restoration, he brings increase. God does not just restore and take you back to where you used to be before. He increases you. He increases you. That was what I loved most about, you know, Pastor Reddy when we were younger. His expectation of God was just unbelievably unreal. It was so unreal, the rest of us were just riding on it. All his friends, including myself, we were riding on it. He would say, well, he said, it's part of God's restoration program. In fact, I remember I told them, in those days, he said, I gave myself seven years to catch up. That everything that the enemy stole from me, within seven years, I'm going to get double plus more. Double plus, double plus, double plus. So he was always expectant. And that expectation was given to, well, was shared in his heart. As he was sharing it, many of us were hanging on to it <laughs> and holding on to it and experiencing and experiencing more and more ourselves. God's restoration gives you increase. When God restores you, it will make you be- not just better, not just up to where you used to be before, but it will get you beyond where you used to be before. And it doesn't matter what has been said about you. Another return of the restoration is that God's restoration will remove shame from you and bring you honor. That's what his word says. He will remove shame and he will bring you honor. You see, this year when he gave us the word of prophecy in Isaiah chapter 61, he said, instead of your shame, I will give you double honor. As at that time, in Joel chapter 2, he said, God became jealous for his people and his land and he decided to remove their shame. That's our God for you. He removes shame. If you go back to that same scripture and you read, and you read back, from verse 12, he said, Therefore also now, said the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with all fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart, not, not your, just your garment, and then turn to the Lord. And then he goes ahead and he says, God himself would take away the reproach of his people. Look at verse 17. He said, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and give unto their heritage not reproach that, your, that the Eden might not say, where is their God? And on the back of that, the Bible says in verse 18, then will the Lord be jealous on behalf of his land and the Lord will answer and he will send corn and he will satisfy. And he started talking about all the things he will do. Because God does not want you to be put to shame. He doesn't want the world to say, where is our God? So God will restore and remove shame from you. You see, it's very shameful when the one that says God is speaking to me. Everybody knows you go to church every Sunday. Everybody knows you've been yapping on about what God does, but you are the one that have lost your job. You are the one that is having problems at work. You are the one whose child is not doing well in school, and everybody else's child is doing well. You are the one who has lost investment. You are the one that everybody else is saying, oh, so sorry about your whatever it is. But God says, in order for that to, be, for him to put an end to that, he will restore to you, and when he restores, he will remove shame from you. If you read Isaiah chapter 54 verses 4 to 6, he was talking about the barren woman. He said, no, instead of your shame, you will have. Instead of your shame, you will have. It's a replacement program. When God wants to restore for a man, he replaces. And he replaces really, really good. When God restores, he brings victory. He brings victory. He says, I will build. I will build. I will build. You know, I don't know what you have struggled with and where the challenge has been up till now. I don't know what has defeated you before now, but I can tell you very clearly that restoration is at hand and when God restores, it brings victory. You know, in the children of Israel, if you go back and read Joel chapter 1 and Joel chapter 2 and Isaiah chapter 54, they have gone through so much challenges. It was constant defeat after defeat. They believed God, they were knocked down. Things happened, they were knocked down. But they were, by the time God is set to restore, it brings victory. Victory that has nothing to do with your strategy, your plan, your ways, your method. Victory that has to do with what God can deliver to a man. That's what God can do. I want you to whip up a strong appetite for the restoration program and plan of God for your life. The last one I'm going to talk about there is when God restores, he multiplies your fruitfulness. He multiplies your fruitfulness. You see, I was thinking about the, the, uh, uh, the parable where Jesus talked about the, multi, the, 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 the harvest in multiples. That some, when you sow a seed, it produced 30, another produced 60, another produced 100 fold. And I was just thinking that if you have a, 
a, a, a year, when somebody produces 30 fold, 30 fold over the next 10 years is 300. 30 fold over the next 10 years is 300. But what if God decides to restore and give you an, a 100% fruitfulness? 100% fruitfulness means in three years, you make 300. 30% fruitfulness, everybody say you're still doing okay, something is coming into the family. In 10 years, you make 300. But when God restores, it gives you hundredfold returns. That in three years, you make what everybody else makes in 10 years. Even people that are making 60, they say they've done well. 60 will not get to 100 until five years' time. 60, sorry, will not get to 300 until five years' time. But when God gives you hundredfold returns in three years, you have achieved what even the 60% person have done. What I'm saying to you is this. When God restores, it gives you 100% multiplication and you catch up with everyone that you think have gone ahead of you and everything you think you have lost, you catch up with them. Why? It's God's restoration program. It is not your restoration program. It is not my restoration program. It is not the government's restoration program. Government can never restore you to the place that you've been before and beyond. They can help, but they can never restore the way my God does. So the quicker you begin to trust God for your restoration, the better. God has a restoration plan for you, and you can recover every single thing you have lost. I want you to be hungry for it, because when he blesses you, he multiplies. When he blesses you, it increases. See, when that restoration comes, it's for multiplication, it's for your increase, it's to remove shame from you, it's to give you victory, it's to better your soul and give you joy. And that's my God for you. So what do you need to do? Let me end with what you need to do because there are requirements to restoration. The first one, I told you the reasons why we need restoration, the lost years and the things that the locust has taken from us. Then I told you the results of restoration when God restores all the things he's going to do. Lastly, I'm going to leave you with your requirements for restoration. What do you need to do? P usually says something that a, a, a faith that does not leave you with responsibilities and irresponsible faith. Christianity is not irresponsible. Christianity leaves you with a responsibility. You have things to do. In fact, if you notice with these people, they did some things for God to bring restoration back to their land. Turn your Bibles with me again to Joel chapter 2. How do you activate your restoration? How do you enjoy this restoration that God has planned for you? If you read with me from verses 12 to 13 of Joel chapter 2. Uh, uh, from verses 12 to 13 of Joel chapter 2. The Bible says, and I read, Therefore also says the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fastings and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garment and turn unto the Lord your God for he is, he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repents to him of your evil. He starts with turning to God. It starts with turning to God. Turning to God in what I would call supplication. That's the starting point. You turn to God. You want to experience restoration. Turn to God and say, God, in this area and this area and this area, I need your restoration. However, I bring myself to you and I ask for your help. And you cry out to the Lord. He says, turn to me. He said, bring your heart. Therefore, say unto the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. With all your heart. Come in the place of prayer with all your heart. Come in the place of prayer with all your heart. You want restoration. You need to do that. You need to lift up your voice to the Lord. You need to ask the Lord for it. The government can give you. Friends can give you. Plans can give you. Your smartness can give you. Your investment can give you. But your God can. Supplication. Say, come to me. Say, turn back. They went to the Lord. They cried out to the Lord. The second thing was their sanctification. He said, don't just cry out to me only. From verses 15 to 17, he says, then clean yourself. Clean yourself. There is a reason why the locust came in the first instance. 15 to 17 of that scripture said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify and then call a solemn fast. And I love the fact that we have taken time to fast in January. So I know that this is already in the bag. He says, so say, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast and let the bride 
groom, let the bridegroom go forth in the, the chambers and the bride out of the closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord. They've come lifting up their voice to the Lord in the place of supplication. Then they come with sanctification, continually lifting up their voices unto the Lord. It says they cry out to the Lord and they cried out to the Lord and the Lord answered them. When God was going to change the story of these people and give them the restoration they're looking for, they needed to turn to the Lord. They needed to cry out to the Lord. They needed to cleanse themselves and make themselves presentable before the Lord. How do we do that? By looking into our hearts and genuinely, genuinely with the all of our hearts, submitting ourselves to the Lord and saying, Lord, show me anything that I need to work on that will not allow me to experience the fullness of what you have in stock for me. And as you do that, God shows it to you and we lay it at the altar and ask for his help to help us. Last week, Pastor preached about restoration of relationships and he's genuinely talked about the old challenge of unforgiveness. If unforgiveness is what is stopping you from experiencing all the beautiful plans of restoration that God has for you, it is not worth it. I don't know what it is that I've caused the locusts to come and eat your farm and eat your harvest, but I know that whatever it is is not worth it. Let it go. Bring yourself in the place of supplication to the Lord. Bring yourself sanctified unto the Lord. Say, sanctify yourself in your fast. Sanctify yourself with your weeping. That is, come before me, lay bare your heart, ask the Lord for help in every area of your life. The third one I discovered there is a declaration. And I love this scripture. In Joel chapter 2, verse 17, he first of all said, he said the priest should say it. He said the priest should declare. But look at Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 22. I actually, when I came across that scripture, I thought, wow, how we lose a lot of things by not just doing the simple things that the Lord has told us to do. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 22. It says, God himself was not happy with what was happening. He then says, but this is a people robbed and spoiled, and they, all of them, are snared in holes. These are the people that are being robbed by the locusts. They are being spoiled. Their the harvest is being taken away, and they are hidden in prison and houses, and they are for a prey. They've become a prey. They've lost so much, and they've come into a place where they are now afraid for their lives. And the Bible says, and nobody delivers them for the spoil, and nobody says restore. He said, no one says restore. He said, these are my people, but these my people have been taken captive. Things have been stolen from them left, right, and center because nobody says restore. The third one is a declaration. A declaration of restoration, which I want you to do wherever you are today. I don't know what you are struggling with. I don't know what needs restoration in any area of your life. But I know one thing for sure. God's word says in Isaiah 42 verse 22 that no one says restore. Be that one that will say restore. If you have health challenges at home, say restore in the name of Jesus. If you have financial challenges at home, say restore. God said, look, these people are struggling and Nobody says restore. That's the reason why they were not restored. Can you imagine? All you and I need to do is to open our mouth and continually say restore. Oh Lord, restore. In the place of prayer, ask the Lord to restore. In the place of your declaration, say what you want to see because God is still in the business of restoring and he will replace every loss in every area of your life in the name of Jesus. Your declaration matters. Your supplication matters. Your sanctification matters. And last but not the least, your dedication unto the Lord. If you look with me to Leviticus chapter 25, your dedication unto the Lord, it matters. Let me read to you Leviticus chapter 25 from verses 18 through to 22. The word of God says, so you shall observe my statutes, your dedication to the Lord. You will listen to my word. You are in church today listening to his word. You will keep my judgment. Listen to his word. Keep his word. Do his will. Serve him faithfully. Your dedication will be rewarded by the Lord. I can tell you that over and over again. I am one for dedicating my time, dedicating my talent, dedicating my treasure to the Lord. And as I do that, I cry back to the Lord. I say, Lord, in my finances, if things are not where they're meant to be, I say, Lord, restore because I am dedicated unto you. This is God's promise. He says, so you shall observe my statutes and keep my judgment and perform them and you will dwell in the land in safety when you do that. Then the land will yield its fruit. I promise you the land is meant to yield its fruit when you are dedicated to the Lord. 
When you are dedicated to the Lord, you have something to cry back to the Lord on. I remember my grandma, she used to insist that I read to her Psalm 20. May the Lord hear you in the days of your trouble. May the God of Jacob answer you. May he remember all your bond offerings and all your sacrifices. When God wants to remember, what will he remember you for? What would you cry out to the Lord that you have dedicated to him this year? On what basis should there be a restoration? It says, when you have served the Lord, when you obey his statute, then you will dwell in the land in safety. Then the land will yield its fruit and you will eat your field and you will dwell in safety. It says, and if you say, what shall we eat on the seventh year? He's talking about the seventh year. He said, don't eat. In fact, it's a year you wouldn't need to work. <laughs> he said, but if you say, what shall we eat? Since we have not sown nor gathered any produce. Can you imagine? You found yourself in a place. Well, what shall we eat since the industry is not open? What shall we eat since hospitality industry is closed? What shall we eat this year because there's no increase in this sector? All the news say things are not going to happen. The Bible says something. Then I will command my blessings on you in the sixth year. And it will bring forth produce for three more years. That's your God. That's your God. You don't need to find yourself where in a place where you have to work so hard in order to eat. No, no, no. You stay in the place of obedience. Stay in the place of dedication to the Lord. That even there are years that you think that the industry is closed. Say, no, the produce that will happen in one year for you will feed you for the next three. That's my God. That's your God. When you are dedicated to the Lord, it will make things happen for you. It will restore to you the years that the can come up, the years that the caterpillar have eaten, and it will restore to you and give you increase beyond your wildest dream. It will restore to you double. Is what in Zechariah says, and I will restore to you double. It says, look, you will not plant, I will command my blessings on you in the sixth year, and I will bring forth produce enough for three years. That's what he said in verse 21 of Leviticus chapter 25. And you shall sow in the eighth year and then eat the produce in the ninth year. But until the produce comes in, you shall continue to eat of your old harvest. That is, your savings will never end. Somehow. Your savings will never end. Even what you work for will produce for the next three years. Who harvest for the next three years what they did years ago? But when you are dedicated to the Lord, when you submit yourself to the Lord, I promise you every single thing that you have looked up to him for, he will deliver to you in the name of Jesus. I end with this story, you know, but I've, I've left you the requirements. Supplication, cry out to the Lord. Sanctification, ask the Lord to check your heart, cleanse you, and anything that is inside of you that will stop his work, lay them down at his altar. I said, then declaration. He said, nobody said restore. Be the one to say restore concerning every area of your life that is not working. Stop saying what the news says. Stop saying what the facts say. Stop saying what the doctors say. Stop saying what your finance manager says. Start saying what the Lord has said to you. Somebody must cry restore. Declaration. And last but not least, your dedication. Where's your talent going? Where's your time going? Where's your treasure going? When God looks for who to restore, will he see something of the fruit that you have sown before, of the seed that you have placed in the ground before? What will he see when he wants to bring restoration? I end with this story. I read this story. It's a true life story in 1870 in America. It was called the year of the great locust. Locust came to the old Minnesota area, all the way to, to, to Texas. And I understood that the locusts ate everything possible. Prior to then, the government was saying people should go into agriculture, and they were giving a lot of um, incentives for people to go into agriculture. And then, unfortunately, locusts came. And locusts came this year, 19, 18, 1875 in particular, and ate every single thing. In fact, when you see the account of it, and some of the pictures of it you on know, Wikipedia, it's so sad. Every single thing, plus the, plus the fruit, plus the tree, and it was a time of harvest, everything was eaten, everything was finished. Now, people that took all their savings and went to that part of town because the government had given incentive to go and start a farm, many people just thought, you know what, I'm not doing this farming thing, I'm out of here. And some moved and left their land because there was nothing left. It was bad. And then after that, government started saying, well, what can we do? And they did everything they can in order to get rid of the locusts. Eventually, the locusts were gotten rid of. In fact, they call it the locusts got extinct and nobody know how it happened. Two years later, the locusts were totally gone. No harvest. Hardship for the people. Very true. However, what happened right after that was this. The moment that went, 
The government was determined to do a restoration program and was saying to anyone that, that is still in the area that we're going to bring seed, we're going to bring fertilizers, we're going to bring so many other things that you can use in order to start to plant all over again. Many had already escaped. Many have already gone. Famine is not for me. This industry is not my own. This stress is too much for me. But some farmers stayed back and seed were given. These farmers that stayed back now had the land of the ones that have run away. They now had bigger plots of land. The rest is history, as they say today. In the area of Texas, you now see people who struggled at that time, because, but they had land that now belonged to other people that left it and ran away because it was a difficult year. And now you now have all the beautiful produce that you can see that comes out of America from that same place that was a difficult place. That same place, that same year that you call a difficult year, a difficult time, a difficult period, the time that the locusts and the cankawam was eating, God can restore. Just like it was restored for the farmers in that area that have now become successful and multi-millionaires by staying on to it, God can restore and change your life as well. What have you lost? Because you can get them back. And this is that year for you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. And I now want us to give an offering to the Lord, appreciating God for the word he has sent to us today. I don't know where your finances are at, but I know my God can restore. And I know my God will restore. And when he restores, don't forget, he brings more above and beyond. But you show that you are dedicated to him. You show that you are committed to him. Give God something to work with. And then declare, declare, declare what you want to see. So with your seed in your hand, just before you give it, I want you to declare what this seed should restore. I want you to declare what this seed should restore in the name of Jesus. The details of your giving should be on the page. You can see what you need, how you can give. But let's pray concerning your seed today. Father, thank you. Because you are the one that gives the seed to the sower. And these ones have come with their seed, with their tithe and with their offering. Thank you for receiving it, O oh God, from us. Lord, we pray that this seed will bring restoration. Restoration of finances. Restoration of health. Restoration of mind. Restoration of investment. Restoration of great things that you have promised. Restoration of time in the name of Jesus. Everything that the locusts and the cankawam have eaten, we cancel them tonight and we decree and we declare wholeness for your people in Jesus' precious name. We have prayed. Amen and amen. Now give me a chance to do something. I mentioned earlier that any years before Christ are wasted or lost years. For some people who are out there, you have not given your life to Christ. Restoration program that I'm talking about that will give you the lost years and lost time can only come from God. So I want you to have a new relationship with Jesus so you can experience this restoration that we're talking about. So please be my, uh, give me the opportunity to partner with you and introduce you to this Jesus who can change and turn your life around. If you've never received Christ into your life before and it doesn't matter how bad life has been up till now, a new day has come for you. A change has come in Jesus' name. Lift up your hands wherever you are and put your right hand on your chest and pray this prayer with me. If you want to accept Jesus into your life, it will be my honor to invite you to him and help you with this journey as you start your journey with him. Say these words after me. Lord Jesus, I have come to you today. I am a sinner and I know I learned that you can save me. Help me to start a new relationship with you as I bring my heart to you for a change in the name of Jesus. Help me to dedicate my life to you and start afresh with you. Help me to get to know you better and start walking in this path that you have just shown me today. In Jesus' precious name we've prayed. Amen. Now let me pray for you. Father, thank you for these precious ones that I've chosen to bring their lives back to you. It's my prayer for them today that, Lord, truly, you will accept them into your kingdom and help them to start afresh with you experiencing the restoration you have planned for them in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you because you will help them know you more and be more like you in all the things they do. In Jesus' precious name we've prayed. Amen. If you just give your life to Christ and you want to know where to start from in developing a journey with him, please reach out to me. My details will be on the screen and it will be my pleasure to show you and help you to settle and get to understand this our Jesus better.
Also, if you want to dedicate your life to Christ, you've been with Christ and you've moved away. Maybe like the children of Israel I mentioned in that scripture. It will be my honor to help you in that journey as well. So for all of you that want to rededicate your life to Christ, please pray with me. Father, thank you for this once. I pray in the name of Jesus for a change of story. A new day has come into their lives. Have they come to you to repent and to turn towards you? Lord Jesus, sanctify them according to your word and help them to be rededicated to you and start a fresh walk with you. Help them, oh God, hold them by their hands and help them every step of the way. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. And again, it will be my honor to help you as you progress in your journey with Christ. So please do reach out to me. The Lord bless you and keep you. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. And it's now my honor to invite Pastor Eddie so that we can close this beautiful service. Wow, Paula, brilliant, brilliant. Thank brilliant you. stats about the adult locust. Did, mm. you, did you hear that statistic mm, scary. about the adult locust? Now, can you, can you now imagine what a spiritual locust will do to the destiny of a man? You know, brilliant, brilliant. I pray that whatever it is that represents a spiritual locust in your life, eating away at your destiny, eating away at your investment, eating away at the future of your children. I bind it today Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. We give God all the glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise and blessing. We give God all the glory. Amen. Well, let's close the service. Yes. All right. Let, grab one person by the hand or always, always stretch your hands towards that direction. Yes. So we say this, we we'll do this three times. Come on, one, two, go. Surely, God's, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all, all the days, days of our lives, lives and we shall dwell in the presence of our Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, grab one person by the hand, my friend, and let's prophesy together one, two, go. Surely, God's, God's goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life, and you shall dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Give your neighbor a good hug. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, put your hand upon your forehead and let's prophesy together. One, two, go. Surely, God's, God's goodness, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the presence of my God forever and ever. Amen. You are blessed. Amen. And restoration is yours. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Have a blessed week. Amen. Amen.